Good evening. Uh, at our learning session uh, a couple of weeks ago, Director Lehman asked if we could have a report or a reminder about some of the things um, with the bold proposal about what would happen if we don't move forward with school consolidation. And so tonight what I'm doing is really reviewing information that you've seen many times before. But we also have community members who haven't seen these presentations, and so to review it for them I think will be helpful also. We're looking at a, a chance to move forward, and we're going to be sharing with you what we feel tomorrow can hold for our students. Um, but we also are going to take a look at what, would, what was the uh, life that we lived yesterday. And that was just last year when we had some feedback from our staff about how there were barriers to our kids learning and there were barriers to the support that they needed. Where we've been, we've had unbalanced class sizes and we've had multi-grading. And all of you have been part of a meeting where folks have come and shared their unhappiness with our class sizes and our multi-grading in the past. As Bob had shared earlier, we have between 16 and 33 kids, a difference in class sizes from 16 to 33. So those are things that we've tried to mitigate this last year to move forward for our students. Also, when we had our results this evening and our initial look at Thought Exchange, class size was number one. Student support varies by building. If you are in a smaller school, you have less support for your students. If you're in a larger school, you might not have enough support for your students. We've had financial instability. We've gone through budget cuts. Many of our last, between the last 15 years, about 10 to 12 years of budget cutting. We've had inconsistent leadership. And when people leave the system, their knowledge leaves with them and the system is less for it. We've talked to you about Swiss cheese and the holes that are within our system, and that's been very evident. We also have holes in our programming <coughs> where it's not consistent. When Bob shared with you that we are static and not making some of the gains that we need to in math and reading, there are holes in our support, and we need to put systems in place that serve all of our students. We've had reactive budget decisions and reductions. We haven't been planful, and we haven't engaged in budget development. If we're a healthy district, we should be able to engage in budget development versus budget reductions. And we've had loss of student enrollment due to program cuts. Everybody has a different opinion on why we're really losing students. The folks that I have talked to have shared with me that their student might have needed extra reading or math support. They might have needed a student advocate and those pieces weren't there. They also shared class size, and as you can see, our community is very concerned about that. So these are things that people have given to me as reasons why they're leaving the district. I'm sure there are others. Where we're going. We'd like to reduce barriers to learning by balancing our class sizes and limiting multi-grading. We did that this year. With your help, we used some of the fund balance to be able to do that for all of our students. We would have looked at about 10 multi-grade classes this year. We're providing students with more access to counselors, social workers, psychologists, math and reading specialists, and EL teachers. We're partnering with our community members. An example of that is with our Youth Services Bureau to bring more support to our students. As you've seen from the data tonight, our students need that support and that's not changing. We're better training our staff and they've asked for more time to collaborate. We're increasing stability and consistency and we're aligning our learning systems to, fill, to fulfill the Bridge to Excellence. The Bridge to Excellence brought together 250 community members. That is the plan. When I started in this position, the clear direction from the board was to make sure that the Bridge to Excellence was implemented. To do that work, we need to look at our systems differently. How we got here. Many of the things that I just mentioned, um, you already know. But our district was built for about 10,000 students, and now we're serving fewer than 8,500. We've had a decline in enrollment. We've had budget cuts. But we have systemic problems that need systemic solutions if you want long-term health for the district. We also have a growing community in the southern part of our district. As I'll share in my superintendent's report, we had an um, evening Brookview bingo last week with our Valley Crossing families who met um, Eagle Brook Church has partnered with us to provide space while Brookview is being 
built and we had a number of families show up and um, Mark Drummerhausen was our game host for that evening, but they are very excited to be back and be included and be part of our district. We've shared this slide for, before with you and when people ask us, what do we mean by equity? If you look at the slide at the left, if everyone has the same resources, it doesn't meet every student's need. And people ask me, they'll say, well, you know, my child doesn't need special education and they aren't um, a student he, who needs gifted services, so why should I care about this? If teachers don't have the support in the classroom, the students who are in the middle aren't going to get the support that they need either. When we talk about all kids growing, we need support for everyone. If you look at the slide in the middle, the students there are getting the support, but there can still be barriers. You can see the wall in front of them. We're trying to remove that wall so that everybody can have the same access to what they need. We are uh, morally and legally now obligated to do that. We've only just started this process, and by the board setting aside fund balance last year, we were able to balance class size. We eliminated multi-grading at elementary level, and this impacted every school. We started to balance class sizes at the secondary, but we haven't done enough. We've started technology upgrades and we've enhanced our infrastructure, was, which was sorely in need of support for that. And we've replaced eight-year-old laptops and are beginning, just beginning, to purchase student devices. We've increased student support and we've provided curriculum development for our pre-K, middle school, and ninth grade transitions, our, our grade configuration. And then we've added additional support for our social and emotional uh, needs of our students. We invested one time dollars to do this. So if we want to continue to do this, we have to find places of inefficiency within the system to be able to do that. On this chart, you'll see the one-time funds that we've used to support students, and you'll see a price tag associated with it. <coughs> we've increased 14.6 full-time FTEs and teaching staff to address our class size and eliminate multi-grading. That includes the related specialists that we needed to do that. The price tag for that is 1.6 million. We've added additional staffing, including licensed special education staff, behavioral speci specialists, excuse me, you can see the um, different things that we've added there at a price tag of $485,000. We've increased music across band, orchestra, and vocal music. Part of that has to do with our um, specialists moving between buildings and needing be to be able to support our students with that. And then again, as I mentioned with technology, we are just begun um, by enhancing the infrastructure and then um, starting to replace the eight-year-old laptops. But you know that textbooks are not the wave of the future. Technology is, and so we need to have devices and access for our students. That needs to be something as regular as oxygen for them. It's just part of their world. Future funding needs. Annual costs here are based on our grade configuration changes. Whether we close schools or not, because of our grade configuration changes, these are additional costs that we'll be experiencing. The additional <coughs> cost for transportation goes from six dollars to $750,000. The lower end is if we don't consolidate schools, the higher end is if we, wait, <laughs> if we, yeah, lower end is if we do consolidate uh, schools, higher end is if we don't. The middle school model, we've talked about what we want to serve our kids and how do we want to support them. We're beginning with a $400,000 increase to give them the social and emotional uh, support that they need. We also have increased needs for the high school support staff as we move our ninth graders up and attend to their needs. So that price tag, although we don't like to talk about price tags and we want to think that we give our kids what they need, there are real costs associated with these and you can see it can be anywhere from um, 1.3 to 2.05 million. If we move forward with bold, as much as I'd like to believe that people could see the other side of bold, bold unfortunately does um, include school consolidation and closure. You've seen and we've shared with you where we're wasting money with too many open spaces. We'd like to take that money, but the real purpose of bold is what bold stands for building opportunities for our kids to learn and discover. On the left-hand side, you can see the things that we'd like to do as we move forward. Again, it's about increased access for our teachers. If you are a student and you come into Stillwater Schools and you happen to speak Arabic 
and you, let's say you're in um, Afton Lakeland. I don't know how many of you have ever had the experience of going into a culture where you don't know anything about the language or anything about the culture or the customs. If you have and you've spent time, you can imagine little ones coming to our schools without the support they need or having a teacher who's very willing to help, but they're 50 minutes a week. How are we going to close the achievement gap and the opportunity gap for our kids if that's all we provide? Balanced class sizes, we've heard time and time again. I think a few of you have shared that for the last many years, that's been a topic within this district. When we're spread out so much and we have smaller schools, it's harder to balance that class size. You can go to any district in the metro area of the nation and they'll tell you the same thing. It's not something that's specific to Stillwater. We want middle schools that offer our students explorative, integrative, and relevant learning experiences. We want them to be engaged. We want to move forward with learning spaces for our students. We'd like to move gate to Stillwater Junior High so kids and families can have access. We'd like to have better science classrooms, special education places, and flexible learning spaces, not only at the high school, but in our buildings to support kids' learning needs. And we know again that we need additional staff at the high school with the addition of ninth grade. Those were things that were not uh, planned for in their real cost. If we reverse bold, I wanna emphasize this isn't a scare tactic. We are not engaged in the process of scaring the, uh, scaring the community. We're engaged in trying to support our learners. Our job is to support our kids and teachers. That's what you hired me for. That's what I hired this group for. If we reverse bold, elementary schools, their capacity will be below 77%. As Dr. McDowell shared with you, we love to have extra space. We think we can do innovative things with those spaces, but to think that we're going to move kids to all of those spaces, that would be another 4.6 million. We know we wouldn't be able to do that. We have 40 plus unoccupied classrooms across the district, and as he mentioned also, right now, you won't see that. We haven't moved the kids out, and we have a great, um, I was over at Stonebridge this morning and visiting with the staff, and they said, when we have space, we move, because we can put a play center somewhere. We can you know, fill in places. We can have a science lab that we leave up all day, and we don't have to bring down. Those are great advantages, and we don't want to take all of that away, but we can have that much empty space. We'll have 32 classrooms outside the class range. When parents come to me, and they tell me that they are upset because their sixth grade classroom has 33 or 34 students in it, that will be the reality. Multi-grading is estimated at 10 to 15 classrooms. And we've already talked about multi-grading. When multi-grading is used as a way to address class size and, and a, a finance piece, it doesn't work. It works when it's multi-age and it's planful and it's consistent and the teachers who want to be part of that are part of that. But it, when it's not planful and it's just used as a way to balance class size, it's not effective. We'll be back to annual budget reductions on a yearly basis. We won't be engaged in budget development. We'll have further loss of resources. We won't be able to do what we want to do for our students with technology and access. If we talk about preparing our kids for 21st century and the workplace, career, and college, they have to have access to technology. And then finally, the loss of support services. And you can see those listed here. And as board members, you know that we have real needs and tragedies within our community that our students experience. We need support. So what is this all about for myself, for the team, and I know for the board, for all of you, it really is about providing the bridge to excellence that the community came together three years ago to tell us what our direction was. My direction from you was to implement that. And to be able to do that, we need to recoup some of the money that was initially shared with you when Bridge to Excellence came to be, that we would need to find 25% cost savings within our district. We have not done that. Now is the time, and you've made the choice, some really hard choices about how to be able to do that. But when you look at this slide and you see our students and all the things that are listed here, those are the things that we want for our students. That's what our community has told us that they want through the Bridge to Excellence, and that's what our commitment to our students is. So with that, I'm gonna close, and um, not only for myself, but the team is happy to take 
questions if you have clarifying questions or things that you'd like us to answer questions comments i just i, I want to make a comment um, it's ironic that we're talking about growth on the south side because tonight at oakland junior high um, there's a community meeting um, with the prairie island community um, leaders who have uh, approached or basically they purchased in June of 2015 112 acres in West Lakeland Township and um, they are meeting with um, community uh, of West Lakeland to talk about what they want to do with that land and from my conversations with um, the local uh, elected officials for West Lakeland Township what they have indicated in their conversations with the Prairie Island community is that they want to build homes in that area and so um, that's an influx of uh, new uh, people into our district as well as um, s children that will be coming into the district so again we're faced with uh, extreme pressure for growth on the south side of our district so um, it, it is something that's real um, and something that we can see and something that the community can certainly come involved in because uh, they can go to those meetings and hear what um, those people, uh, the Prairie Island community is thinking about doing with 112 acres, so. Um, just okay. a follow up, I mean, Kathy brought it up during the open forum, but why can't the community just vote to raise the money? in 2013 the board made a decision to go just about to the cap at that time I want to say we were about nine or ten dollars away from the cap when we went out for a vote the last time so you were at max um, since then as the Department of Education and the state of Minnesota loves to do funding formulas have changed and so now in going back and pardon me for one second while I flip to the appropriate page now going back and I'm going to take our 14 uh, 2014 pay 2015 levy which means that's for the 15 16 school year and the reason why I chose the 15 16 school year levy was because it was referencing what Dr. McDowell was doing as far as what our expenses go in the open classroom so I was trying to keep the same kind of context to year as to why I grabbed those numbers. But when I look, I say, okay, the cap, um, we're approximately, give or take, $436, I won't even say give or take, I'll say exact, $436.65 away from the cap right. per student. And this formula is based on pupil units, not ADM, not head count, it's pupil units. And when you multiply that out, we're at approximately, we would generate approximately $3.965 million in revenue. Now, again, this is 15, 16 numbers. Um, and if we were looking at expenses of $4.6 million or, you know, supporting, and I don't know if it's exactly addressing the question that the gentleman had asked about what does it cost and the cost that we're given to fund, that's not, I was just truly taking the $4.6 million there's not enough there. So another question, because I remember about a year after the levy passed, um, you came to us and said we had an opportunity to shift some of our um, taxpayer approved levy mm -hmm. to non-taxpayer approved levy. There were actually two categories and I think we only shifted one um, because by not shifting it, we gave up some matching dollars, mm -hmm. correct? There are. Oh, I'm asking you for a very specific. Um, no, that's okay. Is there that what created the space? What created the space? There were two different areas. The one was um, a $300 board approved. The board could do a $300 board approved, and then the, there was also, and the title has changed, but it was location equity or right. local optional, which is another $424. That $424 was the shift right. in moving that from where we were in the formula change and taking it away, I mean, that's essentially what gave us the play. Right. Okay. 
Other thoughts? I'm confused a little bit. In, in, in reference to our open forum, yes. we stand to regroup if you follow the bold proposal. I think something like 1.2 million Correct. per year mm -hmm. for reinvesting. And apart from the political part of this, trying to pass a levy that would bring in 3.96 million per year, mm -hmm. saying it's not enough. So fill me in. Um, my understanding, and I'm not saying my recall from the open forum is correct, I thought it was kind of twofold. Um, I thought it was what could we have in voter approval, so that was the 3.965, and then what would it cost to equally staff or to provide the same, and maybe that's where my, I misunderstood. And, and could I ask this, and, and I would ask the chair, I think the gentleman is still here, can, can we ask him, is Tony? Yeah. And Do you wanna clarify, uh, did you hear Kristen's comment? Yeah, it was, uh, oh my, I'm not sure if I even made my point clear. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I was looking for what would the numbers have been, or what would they be if the uh, school closures weren't going to happen, and the additional staffing, support people, psych, school psychologists, and science programs, and all that were going to be as if bull did happen in the in the fewer schools. But my point was, if that question was put to the voters of the district, and they vote up or down on it, we wouldn't have had this controversy. You're either going to agree to pay to keep those schools open and have those uh, the high level of education uh, with the bridge to excellence and all that strategy in place, or the school district voters voted out. That was the choice that was not given, and I think it might have avoided all the controversy we're seeing right now. Thank you. Which one? Yeah, because I, I wanted him to give you his question, not me. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just I was trying to address the Sykes and all of that, sure. and that's all I was trying to do. Yeah. So what so, I heard. So what would be the your answer to him? Not <laughs> well, me. That, and there and, and so you have the revenue piece of it, the 3.965, um, the expenditure side of it, and this is where it's. I'm trying to again. Um, it's I I don't recall the number that we gave when we were working through last winter about what support staff and and maybe Kathy does remember. All I was trying to address was the number that Dr. McDowell said that was, I was kind of doing the, and that might not. We can, we can try fine. We yeah. addressed and talked about that last year if we would have small schools yeah. throughout the community and what the cost would be. It, it's so there, it's just that. unfortunately. I, it was in one of the January presentations. It was, yeah. Well, and, and all I'm saying, and, and I think he's raised a nice mm -hmm. scenario to consider, look at. I'm not trying to pass judgment as much as to answer this question. Yeah, and I believe at least with the revenue piece, I did. Right. But what I heard you say, Kristen, was that if we did do that, sir, if we, if we tried to ev evenly distribute, so to speak, and provide the services that we we are striving to, to provide equally to each and every school, that that would exceed what the, the levy would generate. We, we, we still would not have enough money. And um, I was going off of the, cl uh, the classroom space, you know, off of the presentation. I would be more comfortable if we could reference the January document because I don't have that in my recall. Okay. So just to clarify that, that $4.6 million was, is that the number you shared a little is that, was that in your slide, Bob? That, that was, if, was we if we staffed class, the empty if, classrooms. If we staffed all 41 yeah. of those classrooms yeah. with the teacher. That's not saying, I mean, that's empty classrooms. That's not talking about the support staff and all those things. So to get an accurate, and we know right now that in our uh, community we need to make sure um, if we throw out a number and we're mm -hmm. one point off. I think the other piece that I'd like to raise is um, we had a conversation at the board level about moving forward with a levy and um, we asked if you would want us to go deeper into that capacity study because we knew that there was um, operating um, expenses that were being paid that weren't necessarily um, being very thrifty with our money. And so before I could, and I shared this with you, recommend that we look at anything like that, uh, we asked to do a further capacity study, which is where we went, and then um, we're able to show you know, that there's about 
70% capacity rate versus what we'd want. So that part I think is talking about, we hear, you know, one of the things we talk about is we have 30 to 40% of our population has kids in schools in our community, and there's uh, 60 to 70% who do not and expect us to use our money wisely. And so that conversation was back in October of last year. Well, and I think you went to tonight and Mike went to at the forum the other night. People are forgetting when the levy was first put forward, we said, I mean, we sat here and looked at slides that said 25% of the money for the bridge to excellence has got to come from efficiencies. Now, whether or not people understood what efficiencies were, I think the board understood what that meant. We needed to, if we were going to implement what we, we said we were going to implement, we needed to budget cut our way to 25% of those dollars. I don't think there was any surprise on the part of anybody. We heard it. I, the community heard it. We maybe understood budget cuts instead of efficiencies, but uh, you know that's that's out there, and we've got to do something to, to get that twenty. Nobody wants to face cuts, and and think of the conversations we've had over the years where people have said, "Well, we want to add this, we want to add this, we want to add this." Well, okay, now you got to cut this, cut this, cut. You, you can't keep adding. I, I think that was part of our conversation back then. We've got to cut something. Mm -hmm. We've got, we, we are not going to be able to come up with that 25%, and we all knew it any yeah. other way. But the challenge, the challenge, well, we knew it. <laughs> yeah. I think it never sank in with the public. I can remember going to one of the schools that, that I was working with, and after we passed the levy, their belief was we were going to have more money than we knew what to do with. Now, again, that wasn't us, but that's what they understood in terms of passing the levy. And it was a shock afterwards for them. And in, in fairness to the board, I, I truly believe this, uh, and board members, please feel free to disagree with me, we heard about the 25% efficiencies very, very late in the process. That's not true. I don't know. Okay. Well, and it's I, funny you say that because I served on the Bridge to Excellence, and that was, I mean, I, I had a conversation with Dr. Lunn uh, because he was kind of the, uh, brought the Bridge to Excellence together. And, and when Dr. Lunn was a superintendent, it was, and I agree with you, Mike, you know, perception of what we hear versus what the community hears may be two different things, but it was abundantly clear to me that part of the bridge to excellence was that we had to have skin in the game with regards to this, that um, we had to, to know that 25% of this plan was to come through either efficiencies or um, looking at new ideas. And, and the people that were on that committee um, with me, Natalie Feedy was there, a lot of other community members I've had an opportunity to go back and ask them because uh, I agree with you, that's an important um, distinction. And um, like I said, talking to Dr. Lunn, talking to the people who I knew who were on that committee, everyone understood that that was going to be a component going forward with that Bridge to Excellence plan, so. Tom, do you recall what that dollar amount would have been? Because I wasn't on the board, the 25%, do you? I, I don't, I'd have to go back yeah. and look at my notes. No, so when I, when Shelly and I ran, so that was, I'll speak just for myself, correct, when I was door knocking, that was overwhelmingly what I heard. There's a lot of parallels, I think, from my perspective. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people had told me that they felt that the levy did not deliver everything that they had thought it would, that, um, they thought class sizes, We I thought class sizes were going to go down. Um, I did not have a real full understanding of the cuts that still were being made. And in that year alone, when I ran, my fourth grade son was in a class of 32, and we still had to cut $2,503,556. And I look at that and I think, that is 25 teachers that we could have arguably put into our system across the board to, to, to level the playing field, so to speak, and, and put teachers and instructional staff where they needed to be. But because of the trajectory and the arc of where we had been the prior 10, 15 years, um, in large part because of the state, 
um, we were still in cutting mode. And so for me, there was a real dissonance of trying to reconcile. We just passed a levy and we still had to, had to cut. So I, I absolutely understand, I think, some of the, the confusion of, of, of where we are now. I think there are a lot of parallels. And I think that um, when, I, when I had a better understanding of the financial situation, realizing that, um, you know what, we, we just, we are not flush with cash like we thought we were with the levy. And I just was going back from notes just over, just anecdotally, friends that have left our district since my kids started. Um, I count 24 and that's just off the top of my head. And these are people that I, I know really well that I've tried to market back and or, um, recruit back. Um, and they left because of large class sizes. Hands down, that was the, the reason. The class sizes were too big. And it wasn't just at Lake Elmo, it was across the board. So I think absolutely, and it's consistent with, with, with what we saw with this um, thought exchange, that um, we need a systemic solution to a systemic issue that has pervaded our system for far too long. Uh, uh, Chris Keister brought forward um, information that is on the website and has been there about the levy. And when we renewed the expiring levy, um, it was for $10.1 <coughs> million less state funding for all-day kindergarten because, as you remember, we started that before. Um, we had funding for that. And um, so part of the $10.1 million, 3.24 of that was to address the budget shortfall that we had. It was an annual budget shortfall. In addition to that, then, invest to bridge to excellence, the new bridge to excellence, the new strategic plan, 2.4 million. And you could view the bridge to excellence budget and see how things were invested. And it says right here, the levy would provide support for 75% of this two to four year action steps. The <coughs> remainder would need to be paid by reallocating resources. And then 450,000 was for enhancing school safety and security. I guess, um, Superintendent Pontrelli, I just would like to say that I think you're a very courageous leader. Um, I think we're all very aware that this topic has created a, a climate of anger in our community. And a lot of that anger is directed at you. And I know for you bringing it up again tonight, it will likely create more anger. Uh, but not only you, but your staff and your administrators. Um, it's, it's pitting groups of students against each other, and it's really building a negative image for our school district, which um, greatly concerns me. Um, the second thing is, as I've been out talking with people, I'm hearing from people who are very concerned about this climate in our community. Um, I don't think anyone likes it. Um, but it's growing, and um, that's, that's very disconcerting. So again, I, I think you're very courageous to stand up and, and share more information so people have a better understanding. Um, and then the last thing I want to just share, as I read the goals for tonight, um, our goals that we um, unanimous, unanimously approved as a board, I'm going to be really honest. As I read them, I thought, we're not fulfilling our role. Um, we have, as a board, agreed that we would partner with administration to assure that all students are provided with an equitable opportunities to reach their maximum potential. <coughs> we are a dysfunctional board. This is a board that last month could not agree to work together based on trust. If we cannot work together based on trust, we cannot function well. And we are clearly not partnering with you as we should. We hired you to improve our teaching and learning. We hired you to implement the Bridge to Excellence, which was built from our community. And as far as I can tell, everyone is still supportive of moving in that direction. So I admire your courage. Um, as I've talked with people who have lived in this district for a number of years. Many people recognize that this was a recommendation that needed to be done many years ago, 
But I think, frankly, people were, were scared because it was such a difficult decision. So I think you've been extremely truthful and honest, and I think that you have kept the hearts and the minds of our students at the front. And um, I think everyone in education cares about kids, and um, I just want to thank you for, for your leadership and, and courage. So thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much.